And them years, of, that, that four year marriage in Night America ended last year this time. Um, I, had to, I had to realize that there were need within me to reassess this anger I had. See, I, I'm a gilded advocate, activist. I'm on a lawsuit that's suing the government of the state of Georgia right now that's being entertained by the Supreme Court by the voter suppression. I'm, I'm called to this because of who my father was before me and his father was before him. I, I, it is just as much a part of me as the gospel of Jesus Christ that my grandfather called this poor siblings of mine into uh, in, in his walk with God. And, and so how do you balance this call of the wild, this external call about being the body of Christ? How do you balance that with being who you are called to do when you speak to the heart, the soul, the hurt? I don't know. I had to learn that. See, because I had learned that the call I thought myself to be was not necessarily him, but it was through my addiction to crack okay. that I came to understand who I really was 30 years ago, before Craig. <laughs> Me and Richard Pryor was hanging out there. But it made me know who I am. It made me understand the grace that was on me. It made me understand the compassion I needed with my loop self to understand the hurt of common people and the things that they deal with and, and my empathy uh, muscle increased as I learned how to do what it is you call me to do in the state house in order to, 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 to move the kingdom of heaven forward. See, if we're not doing it for the kingdom of heaven, we're doing it for self glorification or self-aggrandizement or we're doing it for reasons that are not necessarily reasons that God would have us. So we come and, and we, as leaders of the house, realize the importance to change. I had to reassess myself. A young minister who had moved because God told him to uh, had come and said, man, listen, we talk a lot about Donald Trump, man, it's killing us. And I had to, I, I sat there and took my beating. I had, I had to take a look at myself. See, that was the ten, one of the tenets of Narcotics Anonymous that you have to take a feel as a moral editor of yourself. You gotta keep it on blaming other folks for where you are and what you did and what you're gonna do and the hurts and, and building all to the hurt of your past. Don't you get sick of people that don't don't get over their past? Who still collects hostages? I'm this way because my grandma and them told me I wasn't no good. At some point, you gotta accept that it was what it was, and you gotta be about what you need to do to heal yourself of the hurt caused on your life. And in the process of doing a searching and fearless moral inventory of yourself, is the is the is, is the whole process. Lord, I don't know where you're taking me this morning. It's it's also that process of making you come to. David had to do that. David was, his ministry, his life, his failures were, 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 were known. I cannot tell you anybody in the rift between Genesis and Revelation who at, was as tough up from the flow of as David was. And yet we still celebrate his, that he was a man of the God's own hell. What made it that way? What made it that way is that he was able to step outside of himself and look back and say, that was. He was able to look at himself and say, you know what? It was a dismal failure. Folk died trying to get the covenant into the house of the Lord. It was his first act as a king and it was an abject failure. Just because you are called by God does not mean you will not fail. Let me help you out. Failure is an incubator for your success. So I hope you fail. I hope you miss the mark. I hope you fall short because in so doing, you will finally learn how to humble yourself 
under the hand of the Almighty embrace the you that's inside of you that's keeping you from being the best you God called you to be and bring him or her along so that you can be about what it is he created you to do. You got to change. You got to change. If you don't change, you will die. If you don't change, you will die. That's the one that talked about the cultural ramifications of what it is that we do. You have to paint away, show away. You have to show a way of acceptance. Listen, you can't do any of this. You cannot commit to the work. You cannot commit to the people to whom you have been called. You cannot commit to uh, collaborating and, and using the gifts and grace of others and creating a ministry that creates opportunity for those ministry gifts that normally sit behind you thinking, I could have said that differently. I could have done better. Those, we got to create opportunity to get them deployed. And one of the most frustrating things in the world is to be called by God but listen to somebody else preach about God on every Sunday. We got to stop being so selfish with our opportunity and our pulpit and train them up so, so that they can do what it is God called them to do. And that means that we have to change. Listen, family, we have to prepare them, yes. We need to have to grow them there. But we got to learn how to get out of the way and let ministry greet, do, gifts do what you've done. Grow, stumble, forward, fail, but grow. Get back up again and do it again. Then we have to come to this place to, 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 to assess yourself. When, when, when you uh, have the opportunity to take the spiritual and moral inventory of yourself, when you realize that there's something wrong in Zion and you need to change, and when, when you realize that you come to a place where your best thoughts about you might not be the most accurate assessment of you. And, 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 and you find then an opportunity to do something different with yourself. Embrace the change. Listen, we, we don't have it all figured out. I, I, do, do, do you not know that? You don't have it all figured out. You need help. You need other people's ideas. I teach on the five book ministries. Actually, one of my uh, one, one of the areas of the Word of God I consider myself an expert at. It's a five book ministry. I think it's the reason that made me leave the United Methodist Church as a pastor 18, 19 years ago and start Exousia is because I I felt like that environment was not allowing me to move into the five fold ministry area that I believe is necessary, critical for us to advance the kingdom of heaven in this hour. We, we have to make room for the gifts of God to be deployed in one ecclesia, one community in, in the household of faith so that I can have, uh, if, 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 if I struggle in my desire to be a prophet, I might have one right on hand that can help me. Uh, if, if, if my teaching anointing is a little off kilter, I got a teacher in the house. I got what I need in order to equip the saints for the work of the gospel. I, I have, you, you cannot, if you are a pastorally led church, you cannot by your own grace and anointing do everything that you need to do in the house. As you got to create a, a place for the ministry gifts to be deployed and work together, and grow together, and learn together, and love together. And, and, and so after his tragic attempt to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, the success of the second attempt must have been so much sweeter. See what he did in those 90 days in between the two. He assessed himself. He assessed the men that were working with him. He uh, analyzed and decided that we did some things wrong. He, he didn't even know you had no business putting it on a new cart anyway. He didn't even know you had no business preacher uh, uh, putting your hands on it. You, he, God didn't ask you for your help. God told you to bear this. It's supposed to have been on you, not, not, not on some horse, no, ox cart. 
he had to assess himself realizing that his best thoughts about it were all wrong. So all of Israel celebrated with him in the midst of this uh, celebratory entry now into the city the second time. Um, worship had already taken place in the, in, in the back room. He had, uh, he had realized what he had done wrong. We in the pulpit have to realize when we do something wrong. Just because your call did not make you perfect. That's because you have been grace and see you have these demarcations of success throughout the throes in the course of your ministry cannot allow you the opportunity to believe your own press. See, David was so so bad. He was so 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 bad that he had songs that, you know, uh, 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 in vogue of his day was singing songs like, ain't nobody bad like David. <laughs> you know, Amen. they were saying, you know, I know your man good. I know Saul killed a thousand, but David, that David, ain't nobody bad like me. He we, we want to risk preacher when we begin to believe our own breaths. Because of the heart of your people, they're going to compliment you. They're going to tell you, but you do not got out of the park. Prosper, you prophesied your socks on. Uh, you, 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 you laid hands on me and I felt better. And it is a, it's, it's, it's real easy to begin to believe that you are the anointed when you're not. We, we got to be careful about believing what folks say about us. Because ego can kick in. And when you ego and when you are easing God out of the picture, you need to realize that but for the grace of God, go. you need to realize that, 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 that folks, not everybody that's with you is for you. I gotta do that. I gotta quit about this quick. All of us were celebrating. But then all of a sudden, as he was in the midst of the celebratory entrance into the city, Mikal, the other king, um, the king's daughter, Mikal. Not a lot of not a lot of preachers call her. Michael. Mikal uh, was David's wife, the daughter of Saul. And she looked at David's display of praise in this, in this day. And David, however, was so focused on that praise and on that celebration and on that, uh, 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 that, that worship and the fellowship with the people of God that he was getting it right at this time that he had had a do-over and now he's going to get it right. I thank God for do-overs. I yeah. thank God for opportunity. Lord have mercy. I'm a, I'm a child of the do-over. I remember standing in that crack house uh, while running an agency of government on television every week. I remember saying to myself, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I felt it because I was not being me. When I looked into the mirror, I saw something that did not looked like me and it had only been a couple of months. I thank God I got a low tolerance for pain. Because it didn't take a lot to run me up out of there. And so uh, we, we, we had, when, when you're dealing with your grace and the, uh, the anointing, there are a array of principalities and, and, and the prince that, that, are, that are arrayed in places all around you, through and above you that seeks to prevent you from doing that thing God called you to do. And so when we're dealing with these millennials and we're dealing with their struggles and understanding or walking in the things of God, we got to realize that lest the shoes you occupy be empty, you better be careful with your judgment. Listen, I saw some pictures of me back in the day in the 70s. I was a child in the 70s. We smoked everything that would burn. We drunk everything that was wet and we drunk and we dressed like hippies and fringes and afros and everything. We dress crazy. 
during the process, and yet we're so judgmental of our kids. They're your kids. They're my kids. Believe it or not, they have an understanding of God, an angle of God that's way beyond your little churchy boxness. They see the hugeness of God. They see the universality of God. They see God in a whole lot of stuff that you don't. There's an opportunity for them to sharpen on us and grow us. David offered the sacrifices. He was no longer the king at this point. He took off his kingly crown. He took off his kingly armament. Armament. He put on the ephod. He, he, he put on his king's his, his, his priest clothes. And now, as 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 the king, the uh, uh, has taken a back seat to the priest. David successfully walks in there, and he enters uh, Israel into a level of worship that he he he, he perfected on the backside of the desert when he first started making Israel. They didn't even know this stuff could come to church. Bringing them gay bass, bass guitars in here. And, 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 and he led them into a whole different level of praise. And, and he offered sacrifices to God. He, he did blessings according to the rent. He blessed the people, both the men and the women. And, 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 and he gave them all gifts of food and wine. Not just for the assembly, but to take home with them. Taking care of the internal needs of the congregation. And um, it was not diminished. We got a question for you, and we get ready to go. How do we articulate that without antagonizing others? How do we reconfigure with, without saying that we blew it the first time? We have to acknowledge it. So David made a bold attempt to move the ark, uh, and he did so with great praise and celebration. And, and Israel acts of worship. Israel praise showed great reverence for the ark and for the priest slash king which was amongst the holiest things in the temple and in a culture that does not value God. How can we maintain reverence and offer God in our church? How can we not become like the world and yet not stay stuck in some past time of religious paradigm? Mikhail had contempt for David based on his demonstrated worship. Y'all, the church can be a setting in which people from different generations and different cultural backgrounds and different socioeconomic statuses are worshiping together. But how can we respect everyone's freedom to worship God the way they want to? How, how do we lead people into celebration without looking with disdain for those who tend to worship a little bit different from the way we do, at least outward? Or then how do we nurture them into not another place? How can we respect everyone's liberating lesson and experience of God? They sang and they danced. They offered sacrifices. The church, the church exists, listen to the family, as a community to encourage and to equip. And as a body, we, we, we let us support one another as we pursue the things of God yes. and create an atmosphere yes. of sincere worship. Yes. See, as we do what we do, as we plan, as we do the work around commitment and culture and change, as, as, as we do uh, that work and, and, and we still attend to the worship See, the thing is, I, I saw this phenomenon even as I was at young pastor, uh, as a young minister serving holding the goats of the pastor, I, I, I saw this phenomenon where the men and women of God were sitting in the back room while the praise and the worship went on, because see, they didn't have done their, their time doing that. I didn't worship enough. I didn't praise enough. I still got to prepare. If you are not ready to preach with somebody, invite you to come preach when you walk in that door. 
You ain't gonna be ready in the next 30 minutes to take you to sit back there and look old. If you're gonna sit back there and look pious and holy and all of that, you should stay home. Uh, people need to see their worship, their pastor worship. They need to see them praising. I don't care if you are married to McCall. You need to go ahead and get your praise on. You need to get your worship on. You need to, you need to think of his goodness and all that he's done for you. And, and be able to come out your, 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 your see, oh, you know what, your, your suits were not that expensive years ago. You need to come, you need to come out of you and open yourself with God. I got a couple of seeds and we're going to raise up. You become what you celebrate. Whatever a church celebrates regularly will inevitably become rooted in the culture of that congregation. When you go to a worshipful church, like a pastor's church, and you listen to the praise and words, you're like, you know what, these are singing folks up in here. And then you hear the pastor get up to lay out his text, and then all of a sudden he rips into a song. And you understand why that worship is so free. I, I, just a couple of seasons, we're going to go, celebrate the right things. What you talking about, preacher? A church can celebrate any number of milestones. We can celebrate peoples or anniversaries. But you got to recognize that these things are none are necessarily wrong. But churches that celebrate the fruits of evangelism. When somebody come down and join the church, if there, if nobody is celebrating that, then do you really, do you really value that? Since you become what it is that you do, what you celebrate, celebrate. It, it means that you need to. Uh, I think I think Pastor said this. Pastor one was said, celebrate inwardly and celebrate. And, and, and your church will have an inward culture. I, I say it over exousia like this. We'll be a, a, church, a church that's always picking land out of its own belly, but looking inwardly at ourselves. But when you celebrate outwardly, and, and, and your church will have more of an outward appeal. When, when, when you're giving out food, throw on some music, put a prayer booth over there in the corner, and when folks come for a box, they can get prayer and a little jam. Come on now. We are a fluent people. We celebrate the right things and, and, and celebrate outwardly so that your church will have more of an outward focus. Celebrate with the community. That we're so insular. We're so isolated. And one of the best ways to demonstrate Christian grace and the joy of knowing the Lord, of, of being covered by God and walking in the things of God. The joy of being that is to show believers from outside the church, the unchurched, how the fellowship of Christ's followers actually celebrate. This is us. This is how we do it. First, you know, we used to throw house parties in the basement with the blue light. <laughs> Maybe y'all didn't do that. Might have been too safe for that, but <laughs> you need to party out loud. You, you, you need to understand that you are celebrating in the community. And stop partying behind closed doors. Sometimes in the middle of church, I say, open up them doors. Because there's a pathway right through our parking lot to the store. On Sundays, they were supposed to be coming all through there. I'm like, let some of this out. When, when, when your church has a large celebration, let the community know about it. Invite the government. In, invite everybody around. Tell them to come. And some people will never come to church, but they'll come for some food. Turn that into church. Turn it into an opportunity to love God and, 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 and learn about community-wide events so that you can participate with that. Celebrate the right way. 
Don't just throw a big party without some measure of planning in your organization. You just can't put a quarter in the piccolo no more. Always assume that unchurched people will be present at church celebrations, so don't go too secular. So, so, so clearly explain the purpose of the celebration and why the event is significant and why we are rejoicing in the Lord always. And then again, I say rejoice and use this time to share the gospel. Have a team in place to follow up with anyone who expresses an interest to know that Jesus is in your church. Celebrate with excellence. What I love about Pastor Tony and Pastor Alicia is they walk in excellence. They're not in opulence. They're in excellence. They don't have all the resources we need in order to do the heavy lift of ministry that we have to do all the time. So we have to collaborate. This is the year of collaboration. What you do better than me, I need you to come help me do it. A church that can come. You are on it, dog. On it. You are on it. When you are telling somebody that has skills that you don't have, come and help me. Celebrate with that. The only way to multiply a culture of evangelistic celebration is to celebrate with excellence. Live a life when no one is looking, when you're back at your daddy's farm, when you are just hanging out, making this friends. Live a life that it exemplifies Christ and throw a memorable party that celebrates his life. My wife calls me when she goes to work early just to see, are you going to the gym? Are you, what are you doing for today? What is your plans for today? And she said, did you worship? Did you praise? Because you know that's part of my morning ritual. Family, I'm quitting. Celebrations, I gotta say this. By design. Focus on the moment at hand. Or on, on a past event. However, there are also leading indicators of where the church is going. How you celebrate. We need to examine an individual congregation how we celebrate, y'all. And when we do, when we examine what an individual congregation actually celebrates, you're going to likely get a glimpse. You will actually get a revelation on the future of that church. David had a job to do. David had a job to do. And he had a need to get it done. And he collaborated. And he worked. He had prepared for it all his life. And yet, when he tried to do it, he was making a fit. And then he had to call these people again because he's seeing the blessings of Israel not going into somebody else's house. We really don't know it. Just because he had to drop the ark off at somebody's house. Now they're getting Israel's blessings. So he had to rethink his whole process. Acknowledge his failure. And get back in it. And so he studied and showed himself approved. He took off his kingly garb and put on his priestly garb. And he decided, I got to show them why I created these instruments. It wasn't fun for some traditional folks. You know how we did Kirk Franklin when he came out with John? Y'all remember? But we had done the same thing for Hayden because she was too bluesy. We got to stop being so judgmental about new ways of doing what we do. And we need to let leaders lead. And so David said, we're not going to sit here in our fedoras 
and just worship the Lord in a stay serious manner. Today we're going to celebrate what God has done for Israel. I need about two of you to go ahead and give God some praise because you understand the power that comes from worship. You understand the power that comes from celebrating the will, the word, and the way of God. I dare you to want to give God some praise right now. Can you just stand on your feet and celebrate what God has done in your life? Do it like David did. Look back over your life. Think of God's goodness and all that God has done for you. And let your soul cry out, glory, hallelujah. God is good all the time. Give God some praise, saints. That's it. That's all. Thank you.